sometimes they have to stand behind a podium, and then it's like super suspenseful. <laughs> Right? So what if I'm still doing this in 10 years? Like, all there'll be is this little hand. <laughs> and be like, I'm Karen Sarah. <laughs> yeah. And one of the women we're going to talk about today, like me, was very short, under five feet, and had a bad back. But where I took that as a reason to read a lot of books, she took that as a reason to say that she was a proper lady, and that proper lady should stay home. But darn it. Her doctor said she needed fresh air for her spinal problems. It was for her health um, that she rode on the back of a mule across the Rockies in the winter. You know, she had to because, you know, fresh air. <laughs> <laughs> so what I have, and if you're coming in, you're not late, we have like a couple of more minutes, but I'm going to go ahead and kind of do intro stuff. Um, I do a lot of history without being a historian. What that means is that I unashamedly cite Wikipedia in everything I've ever done. <laughs> um, but I, what I, my mission is kind of when I, when I do stuff about kick-ass women in history or other things about history, is not so much to be this authoritative historian because frankly I'm, I'm not one, but to open a Google rabbit hole that you can happily fall down. And the big mission of this presentation is to um, demonstrate that women have always been doing crazy stuff. In every generation, there are expectations for people in society. Usually those expectations are more rigid for women than for men. And in every society, there are women who are like, yeah, but my doctor says I need the fresh air. <laughs> so um, we're going to talk about how, how so some of the things that women did that that fucked up. Um, this is uh, quite Eurocentric, I'm afraid. Um, I do not get into Victorian women in other parts of the British Empire. I'm going to talk about American women and British women. Um, but some amazing stories obviously come out of Asia and India and uh, Africa, particularly because of colonialism, where uh, women of color have always been very, very active in uh, the anti-colonialist movement, and I would really encourage people to pursue that farther. Um, and in England and in America during the Victorian era, there were a lot of women of color, not necessarily in the roles you might expect, and not necessarily in the places that you might expect. So my secondary mission is kind of to say, if you're reading a Regency novel, not everybody in it should be white especially if it takes place in a port town or a big city. But even in rural communities, there were often people of color. They were not the majority. But for instance, it was a fad for a while to have a, a butler who came from Africa that was like, you'd have your, your, your uh, dark-skinned butler that was like a, a mark of status, which obviously is problematic on so many levels, but indicates that you would find a person of color potentially at Kimberley or some other relatively small locale. So that Victorian Regency periods were much more diverse um, in terms of both ethnic um, makeup and in terms of what people were doing than we may have been uh, led to expect um, in our history classes. So I um, have material here that I have done before in a two-hour session, a 90-minute session, and a one-hour session. And today we have 50 minutes. And I have stuff on inventors, soldiers, spies, and travelers. So I'm going to take a quick poll of the room to see if we're evenly balanced, or if it turns out that everybody came here because they all really wanted to hear about the inventors or the spies or something. So, if your primary interest is inventors, raise your hand. This is not a scientific poll, see how I'm not counting? If, you're, if your primary interest is soldiers, raise your hand. Not so much. Okay, let me sum up. There were a lot of women who were soldiers. <laughs> Some of them were probably, sometimes picking apart history is difficult because we don't want to feed into gay, uh, LGBT erasure. But we also don't want to project our vocabulary onto people who wouldn't have been using that vocabulary. So, in every war there's been women who were soldiers. 
Civil War was no different. Crimean War was no different. Some of them um, changed their uh, demeanor for practical reasons, and after the war, it changed right back. Some actually made a lot of money by doing that because they go on the lecture circuit. Um, some lived as men for their entire lives and were probably what we would think of today as transgender. Um, so it just varied. Women have lots of reasons um, to go to war, and the only way to go to be a soldier was to pretend to be male. Of course, that also excludes all the women who went as nurses, as wives, um, as cooks. Um, one woman talked about being in the Crimean War. She went to support her husband, and she was so mad because a cannonball hit her tent, and she survived. But she had just done a big load of laundry, and it got really dirty. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so since our time, the
Ugly. E G L U I. I'm not actually sure how to pronounce your name. E G E G L U I. Ugly. Anyway, she was a black woman, and she invented the first clothes wringing device for a washing machine. It is the same basic model that you have in your washing machine if you are lucky enough to have a washing machine. So let us all say thank you, Ellen. Thank you, um, thank you Ellen. Ellen, however, did not get rich off her invention. She was black and she was very realistic, so she sold her patent for $18. Uh, and she said, you know, I am black. And if it were known that a Negro woman patented the invention, then white ladies would not buy the ringer. I was afraid to be known because of my color in having it introduced into the market. That is the only reason. And in her case, not only was she a woman, but she was a woman of color, so her challenge was heightened. But similar difficulties beset many, many women, both white and black and other ethnicities. As, as they sort of anonymously made things, sold the patents for very little money because they felt that these things were not legal or marketable under their own name. Another inventor, however, was Sarah Breedlove, who uh, went by the name Madame C.J. Walker. Has anyone heard of her? Yeah. So I've always thought of her as a businesswoman, and she was an amazing businesswoman, but she got started by inventing a product that um, worked on hair without stripping the hair. Um, she, early in her life, was a laundress. And black women used to use, and women who were poor, used to use the soap that had lye in it. And, and if you used it too much, your hair would fall out. Mm -hmm. Plus, she had stress, which um, led to her having hair that fell out. And she was a laundress, so she's exposed to like just gunk all the time, horrible chemicals all the time. So her business empire began with Madam Walker's wonderful hair grower, Temple Salve, Tetra Salve, Vegetable Shampoo, and Glossine. Now, several of her early products straightened hair, but she never used the term hair straightener on her products. She was very adamant that she would not use that term. Um, and what she's most famous for, uh, now that other products have come and gone, is that she marketed those to black communities, and she became the first female self-made millionaire in the United States. Mm -hmm. Woo! Yes. Um, she was an orphan at six, married at 14, widowed at 20. Wow. And her brothers were barbers, so when her hair started to fall out from the stress and the chemical exposure, her brothers helped her, and then they started helping her learn about hair products, and then she was like, well, there has to be something better we can put in our hair than this crap. So um, there we go. And um, she was a very savvy businesswoman, um, and I think part of the difference between her and Ellen was market. So she was able to market to other black people. And she also um, became a huge civil rights activist. And uh, much of her fortune went to the civil rights movement. Awesome. A couple other inventors. This is about as steampunky as it gets. I'm going to pass this around later. Sarah Guppy. Even her name, Sarah Guppy. Uh, Sarah Guppy was an English woman. And she lived in a port town. So she came up with a way of removing barnacles from ships. She also came up with a way of preventing soil erosion along railway tracks. She came up with this bed, and, and I couldn't find a picture of the bed all unfolded. And I'll pass this around, but the bed is a built-in home gym. It's like a Bowflex, <laughs> like a really early steampunky Victorian bow flat. So you you start taking parts of it apart, and you dig stuff out from under the bed, and you have like a home gym, and then you fold it all back up and you sleep on it, <laughs> um, as one does. She also invented a way, this is the most steampunk thing I've ever heard in real life, 
a urn for cooking coffee and tea that used the resulting steam to simultaneously cook eggs and keep toast warm. <laughs> Mary Dixon, K-I-E-S, I believe it's Keys, in 1801. Until 1790, women had to file in their husband's name. But after 1790, they could file in their own name, and that is what Mary Dixon did. And her patent is interesting. It was a means of weaving straw into thread, and it was used in the hat-making industry. And this does not sound like a big whoop, except she invented this in 1801, and later we had a little conflict called the War of 1812. During that war and the hostilities leading up to it, Americans weren't supposed to import clothing from France or any other European country. So, hat making became a big domestic business, and her technique made it possible for New England to have this thriving hat making business all through the war. Um, and Dolly Madison, the first lady at the time, gave her a special honor for saving the hat industry of New England. <laughs> Who knew? And then the last one I'm gonna I'm gonna say, and then we're gonna. Oh, here is Madame Walker and her uh, vegetable shampoo, and we can circulate that one. And then here is. Sarah Guppy's weird bed and a paper bag folding machine. How many of you had gone to the grocery store and used a paper bag? And how many of you used to pack your lunches in a paper bag? Which no one does anymore because we put them in these weird insulated things. But um, Margaret Knight invented a, a machine that you can see at the Smithsonian. It's beautiful. And it's a machine that automatically folds paper bags. And it, the paper bag design that we have today comes from that invention. It really hasn't changed very much. The other thing she did, she grew up in the industry, in the, you know, the, the um, textile industry. <laughs> and the very first invention she made, she didn't make much any money off of. But it was a device that would automatically turn machinery off if something were caught in it. Mm. And I can tell from that noise that you guys have enough historical context that like, you're, yes. Um, I would think that's the big thing she should be remembered for. She's remembered for the paper bag folding machine, partly because we still use it, but also because she had to fight so hard to get recognized in court. And her opponent argued that she could not have invented the paper bag folding machine because she was a woman. And women do not invent things. Therefore, a woman could not have invented a paper bag folding machine. Fortunately, the judge saw through this um, dizzying logical <laughs> circle of hell and said, no, she, she invented it, so she was able to get the patent. <laughs> so that is a few inventors. And I'm going to zip on to scientists. Do you guys have any answers, you guys? I never quite know how to piece these, and I always want to leave time for questions. So let's just pause for a minute with inventors. And remember that I am not an inventor. And no, I, I don't know how the paper bag folding machine works. It has shiny parts, it does things. But do you guys have uh, like any quick questions about inventors before we move on? Yes. Actually, I just wanted to add a comment from the Computer History Museum has an evil one list. They do. In Mountain View. Did you guys all hear that? No. Can you come over? I would bring this to you, but I don't no, think I can see it. Hi, I'm Stephanie, and this is a plug for the Computer History Museum. Woo! Yeah. Yeah. And, and we have an Ada Loveless display. We used to have a Babbage machine, but it went back to its original owner. It, it was only on loan to us, and we, that was a year and a half ago, and we still use it. It didn't go back to Charles Babbage because no. he's deceased. It, it went back to Alright, yes, and then yeah. Two things about the, the lady that invented the shampoos. Yeah. Um, wasn't she from Rochester, New York? 
And I believe she's credited as the first person to do franchises. That was like how she came up with the concept of coming up with a, a beauty salon and then franchising the concept. I believe that is correct. She also did a lot of door-to-door -door marketing, kind of Mary Kay style. And then she would set up all these different salons and different different um, fronts. So she was incredible. Okay, I'm going to take one lot, move on to scientists, and then we'll have another um, pause for questions. Yes. Correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't Madam Walker also uh, start with the first woman to actually start a bank? I don't know. I would not be surprised. Repeat the question again, question? The question was, was she, was Madam C.J. Walker the first woman to start a bank? And my answer was, I don't know. So I have a mission, which is if somebody wants to, remember I said this was informal? This is how informal this is. Anybody who wants to Google and tell me, if raise your hand when you got it if she started a bank, because it sounds like the kind of thing she'd do, but I don't actually know the answer to that. Okay, so we're gonna move on to scientists. And I'm gonna back up a little bit from Victoria and talk about a Regency scientist. She's been getting a lot of buzz lately, but when I first started reading about her, I was like, why doesn't everybody know about her? Mary Anning, paleontologist. Okay, are we ooing because paleontologists or because people recognize your name? How many people know her? Yay, oh my God, I love her so much. She was a super annoying person who drove everybody around her crazy. <laughs> but she was awesome. Okay, so if, if like me, you're an English major in a world of science people, here is some trivia with which you can connect your two worlds, okay? Mary Annie was a paleontologist who lived in Lyme, and I'm gonna talk more about her in a minute. Her father built cabinets and stuff. Lyme um, in England is a town built on these chalk cliffs with a lot of erosion. And so it's a great place to find um, the shells and fossils and things. And Lyme had a big industry of selling these weird curios to people. And um, it had sort of a secondary industry of selling cabinets or shelving in little boxes in which you could keep your weird curios. And that's what Mary Anning's father did. So according to Orr, Jane Austen, went to Lyme, which we all remember is the setting in Persuasion, <laughs> where Louisa falls off the seawall because you're not supposed to jump off the seawall. Don't do that. Yeah. There was a different Walker. Magdalena Walker is an African-American teacher and businesswoman who was the first woman to charter a bank in the United States. Okay, do you want to do An expert Googling. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so anyway, Jane Austen's father tried to, no, Jane Austen herself, excuse me, Jane Austen tried to buy a cabinet from Mary Annie's father, but she left in a huff without buying it because she said it was overpriced. So there you go. There is no um, recorded actual interaction between Jane and Mary, we can imagine, but it probably would have been very friendly since it would have consisted of your father charges too much for his cabinets. <laughs> it, I like to picture them bonding, but I'm not sure it would have happened. <laughs> so, Mary Anning was, uh, got her start where she would find fossils and sell them to scientists who were men. She was not allowed to um, publish or appear any of the places where um, science findings were drawn up. So about the best she could do was find stuff and sell them to scientists. However, as years passed, her expertise got so much greater that she was able to piece things together. She was able to come up with theories about how things worked. Um, she discovered the first, let's see if I can pronounce this right, ichthyosaur. Yes. Yeah. How did you, do we have like a five-year-old boy? <laughs> <laughs> ichthyosaur. Ichthyosaur. Yeah. yeah. All right, so she discovered the first, and it was like, and two pleosaur skeletons. And um, so scientists started coming to her, not just to buy her stuff, but to get her knowledge and her feedback. To give them whatever small credit I can, they did push for her to have a pension 
later in her life and for her to have some kind of recognition because she wasn't allowed to um, go give her own speeches or publish under her own name. So she didn't have much credibility as, as a frontline scientist, even though she really was. Um, some of the things she discovered were that um, velaminoids, were, which are a thing, were cephalopods. <laughs> what are velaminoids? They're cephalopods <laughs> that existed in Jurassic and Cretaceous periods. And she proved that they had ink sacs like modern squid. She also found out there was the same people love to collect, which were called Bezoar stones, right? <laughs> Fantasy writers know what I'm talking about, and fantasy readers, because I think they can like to get rid of poison, and they're just really nifty. I'm sorry, they're, um, they're, they're poop. <laughs> <laughs> but they're really magical need poop. <laughs> so she discovered, to all our dismay, that they were fossilized ichthyosaur and thiophore poop. And um, obviously, I'm not the person to do this tongue twister correctly, but she sells Sea shells by the. That's Mary Annie. That was written about Mary Annie. Um, she had several brushes with death. Her best friend was a dog, and I'm not going to tell you what happened to the dog. I will tell you that her work was very dangerous because when I say that the cliffs were eroded, what I mean were they were eroding. They were in the process of eroding all the time. So there were frequent rock falls, and um, don't maybe don't get too attached to the dog. Um, and she, oh, and she loved that dog so much. So there's a picture of my pass around and the dog is in it. Um, a brave martyr to science. Trey, the dog's name is Trey. And this here is the first painting of a scene of prehistoric life based on fossil reconstructions and it used Mary Annie's fossils. It was painted in 1839. Thank you so much. Oh no, I said, don't just be a few of us. I can just pass pieces of people in. <laughs> <laughs> so excited y'all are here. <laughs> All right, so that's Mary Annie. And I'm going to step along a little bit. And there are several really good biographies of, of Mary Annie and also some um, historical fiction about her, too. She's kind of having a moment. <laughs> and a great children's book, too. What's that? There's a great children's book. You have little, little kids. Oh, what's the name of it? Uh, I think it's just called Mary Anning, or I forget the name now, but I read it to my kids, and, and uh, it's, it's a wonderful book. Awesome. And I, I do know from experience that if you go into Amazon or just Google Books, call mm -hmm. Mary Anning, you'll find a lot. Um, there's a lot about her now, which is, I'm so happy that she's finally getting some recognition. Um, I also want to talk a minute about the Harvard computers, because I have some gossip about them that I think you guys will like. Um, is everyone familiar with hidden figures? And, yeah, okay. So you're all familiar with the concept of computers, computers being human beings, right? So women started working as computers very early on. Um, and in the Victorian era, this guy, Sorry, I have to like find my right note because my brain doesn't retain, it just writes things down. <laughs> okay, so this astronomer, Edward Charles Pickering, had some male assistants. So he's working in the Victorian age with his male assistant. His male assistant kept screwing things up and Pickering got really pissed off and he said, my maid could do better than you. <laughs> well, <laughs> as it turns out, out. <laughs> His maid, Wilhelmina Fleming, she had been a school teacher. And then she, so she had, you know, a pretty basic, good sound level of education. She had married a man and had a baby, and the man ran off, um, and she ended up working as a maid to try to keep the family alive. She couldn't go back to school teaching because she had been married and had a child. She was no longer eligible for the teaching profession. So, uh, Pickering hired her in a huff, and Wilhelmina Fleming went on to catalog over 10,000 stars, of which she discovered 222, and discovered the Horsehead Nebula in 1888. 
<laughs> she also became in charge of a group of other computers. The polite term for them was the harbor computers, and the impolite term was Pickering's harem. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of the other people that worked for her, for instance, were Henrietta Swan Leavitt, who was born in 1868 and died in 1921. And she discovered, I'm just going to rattle this off because I don't know what it means, but it sounds really smart. <laughs> Levitt discovered the relation between the luminosity and the period of Cephid variable stars. Though she received little recognition in her lifetime, it was her discovery that first allowed astronomers to measure the distance between the Earth and faraway galaxies. After Levitt's death, Edwin Hubble used the luminosity period relation for Cepheids to determine that the Milky Way is not the only galaxy in the observable universe and that the universe is expanding. And to his credit, Hubble said she deserved the Nobel Prize for her work. Henrietta Swan Levitt, L-E-A-V-I-T-T. -T. And I'm going to pass around a picture of some of the Harvard computers. Uh, I believe that Mary is this one in the, sorry, Wilhelmina is this one in the front, because she looks like she's in charge, and she was very in charge. And I, just for fun, I threw in, uh, Beatrix mm -hmm. Potter was a naturalist, and she wrote a book about mushrooms. Mm -hmm. uh, so here is the cover of her book, which she was unable to present. Yes? If you are interested in hearing more about the Harvard computers, there's a book called The Glass Universe that came out two years ago. It's a great book. It's excellent. And then if you want sci-fi about computers, or actually alternate history about computers, Mary Robin and Cole, of course, yes. has the calculating stars mm -hmm. and the one that I'm halfway through reading right now. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to pass this around. Yes. Uh, did you want a really quick explanation of what you just read about luminosity and period? If you could do it in like two seconds. <laughs> it would probably take about ten. All right, how about this? If you have a minute on your way out, what's your name? Uh, Megan. Megan? Megan is our astronomy person. <laughs> no, it's a really quick explanation. Okay, all right, 10 seconds, go. Okay, so period is the amount of time. Luminosity is how bright the star is. So by measuring how bright the star is and the amount of time, you could tell how far away that star is. Oh, okay. That's it. That's easy. All right. <laughs> Now, um, another one I'll say really quickly is Mary Treat. And the reason I'm mentioning Mary Treat is she's representative of what a lot of women did at the time. Naturalism was a big thing, so that's the study of nature. Um, and she corresponded extensively with Charles Darwin. She um, was married, but then she and her husband separated, and she supported herself entirely through her scientific work after the separation. She wrote, 76 popular and scientific articles and five books. But one of the things that's interesting about her is that when you look at these women who did sort of um, unusual things, particularly when we get into like soldiers and spies and travelers, it helped if they had money. But my original assumption was, well, they were all rich. And that's not necessarily the case. A lot of people just wanted a freaking job. <laughs> For it to be a job, it had to be one that was accessible to their gender. And if it wasn't already, they had to find a way to make it accessible. So Mary Treat and a lot of other women would frame their articles as, in looking at my garden, I ponder the virtues of domestic life. Why here? In my garden alone, I can see 212 species of carnivorous plants. <laughs> so that it was socially acceptable. And a lot, a lot, a lot of women took that route. Um, and we're also gonna see that with some travelers. Some of our travelers didn't give a rip. They were like, especially if they already had money. They were like, I don't wanna get married. 
I don't care about society, and I can support myself. Then others were very careful to frame a narrative in a way that would be socially acceptable. I'd rather stay home. But, you know, the doctor says, I share. <laughs> I didn't want to spend three months snowed in in a cabin in the Colorado Rockies with two strange men, but what can you do? So I just civilized them. That's what I did. <laughs> women should go out and travel more and bring their moral, you know, like Isabella would really lay it on. She would not describe herself as a feminist, and I am uh, bummed out about that. But also, I respect the fact that she worked that system, man. <laughs> she was like, I'm going to work this to my advantage. So before we move on to Isabella, quest quick questions about scientists, knowing that obviously you can already tell am I a scientist? No. So I'm not, I'm not good at that. But just a few quick science questions. And we'll have a chunk at the end, too. Anyone need to pause before we move on? Yes. Just one note on the picture where you mean of Fleming is the one standing up in the rear. I think the one in front is Annie Jump Cannon. Oh, awesome. Thank you. And yes, that book by um, uh, Dana Sobol, The Glass Universe, very, very good, and specifically about that time period. Okay. One in the back. Yes. Um, could you talk briefly about women scientists, researchers in medicine, in medical what I discovered is that when you start looking at women in medicine, it opens up such a huge topic that I can't really, I, I kind of couldn't like cram it in. I, I had sort of a model where I was like, and we'll talk about women in medicine, and then it just like exploded. So here's what I will tell you. That would have to be like a whole separate topic, but amazing things were happening. Um, first of all, in the Crimean War, you have the birth of modern nursing with Florence Nightingale. You also have a black woman from the Caribbean whose name is somewhere in my binder of people. I have a binder full of oh, women. <laughs> 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 nursing, but she saved the lives of tons of hundreds of men in the Crimean War. Then you have women in the Civil War. You have Clara Barton pioneering the Red Cross. Okay? You have women, the Edinburgh Seven, who basically invaded medical school. You have incredible things happening. So yes, I would definitely say the Victorian time period specifically in both England and America and Scotland, where women were, it was not illegal for women to study medicine. They just made it as difficult as possible. But nevertheless, we persisted. And um, <laughs> there we are. I would really encourage like, that, that, you, that you pursue that um, line of questioning because it's, it's really incredible. It's a transformative time. Um, for women's experiences. And for medicine in general, it's the first time when, say, people started washing their hands in between examining patients, mm -hmm. right? You have the early birth of um, uh, germ theory, amazing stuff happening in medicine at the time. Yeah? Do you have brief suggestions for further reading in this area? I will at the end. Okay, thank you. Can I have it again? Uh, the question was, will I have suggestions for reading material? Okay. And I, I will at the end, yeah. I also, you know what, because I have so many people, which is so exciting, I didn't expect, I will have a sign sheet if people want me to go to um, email them anything. Um, I, I can follow up and, and send you stuff if you don't get it as it's going around the room or as I announce it. And as fast as I can. If I <laughs> don't worry. And if I'm very lucky, maybe you'll add something on the sign sheet and you'll say, well, about women doctors, you need to read blah, blah, blah. And I'll go, <laughs> <laughs> So we're going to move on to travelers. Let me check my time. Oh, we're, we're good on time. We have lots of time. Oh, awesome. Who have I got? OK. Oh, sorry. I, I had like extra pages, and I found the first female balloonist. And I didn't like, OK, so lots of pages. <laughs> 
Oh, let's start with her. Yes. <laughs> Sophie Branchard. It's appropriate to start with her because she was a Regency person. By the way, I may have passed out the piece of paper where I scrawled this in a mad Googling session. Oh, here it is. Is anybody into um, collecting fish or going to aquariums? Yep. Yeah, public aquariums, whatever, right? Okay, the aquarium was invented in 1794 by Jean Villepreux, V-I-L-E-P-R-E-A-U-X. People who speak French, help me out. Villepreux? Close enough, okay. Um, she married a marine biologist, and she was a marine biologist in her own right. They worked together, and he was studying the change of Nautilus, and it was a pain in the butt. And she was like, if only we could bring these home and study these at home. Instead of just like dumping them in like a vase or some crap, what if I built them like a really good like box that we could keep them in? Um, she is known as the mother of aquariophily. Aquariophily. She also, side note, she was working class, okay? She was not a rich woman, but she had a leg up in fashion and she ended up designing the wedding gown for Princess Caroline when she wasn't making aquariums and studying chambered nautiluses. So she was self-taught. Her father was a shoemaker, so she taught herself everything she knew. So that was a little, sorry, that was a little sidebar back into adventures. So. Okay, Sophie, travelers. Sophie Blanchard. During the Regency period, there was a hot air ballooning craze. And it, it was a big thing. People had fabric with hot air balloons printed on them and hot air balloon wallpaper and hot air balloon trinkets and big poofy sleeves. And thank you, she's, she's signing to me the poofy, make sure I remember the poofy sleeves. Um, Everybody was all excited about hot air balloons. So, um, uh, Sophie Blanchard was a very nervous person and she was afraid to ride in a carriage and she was afraid of a lot of things. One of the things she was afraid of was starving to death and her husband was sort of an alcoholic and he was a balloonist who never made much money. And he decided that maybe they could make more money if she flew because people would pay to see a woman fly. And of course, she was terrified until the balloon took off and suddenly she felt totally calm. Mm -hmm. It turned out that the balloon was like her thing. She found riding in a balloon to be a sensation incomparable. And from that moment, she was as fearless in the air as she was timid on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, so her husband died in 1809 by falling off a balloon. <laughs> <laughs> This happened a lot. So people, people did weird things in these balloons. One of the things they do is these exhibition flights where the balloon would be tethered, and this is going to be important later, and the balloon would go up, and then you would throw fireworks out of the balloon basket, and nothing no could pass. <laughs> um, and people loved it. So balloonists made a lot of their money by doing these, these exhibition flights. And if you were kind of a low-tier balloonist, you might do them for the county fair, but if you were, you know, a big name, you do it for like kings and princes and stuff. Rich people who could pay you a lot to do incredibly um, ridiculous things. So she um, continued to be a balloonist and she raised enough money through her balloon flights to clear her husband's debt and become financially secure. Um, she used a hydrogen gas balloon as opposed to a hot air balloon. And that meant that throwing firework no okay. Oh. Um, but, but it meant that the balloon needed less fabric. And if it needed less fabric, it was cheaper. And the basket could be teeny tiny. So her basket was just about the size of a chair. Um, and uh, she was, has been described as beautiful and she's been described as ugly, but everyone described her as small, mm -hmm. which also kept it cheap mm -hmm. because the balloon wasn't carrying very much weight. Um, she was not the first woman to ride in a balloon, but she was the first to pilot a balloon on her own and the first to fly professionally. She loved to fly at night and she loved to sleep in her balloon basket while she was flying. Mm -hmm. um, so she did all kinds of, oh, politics, politics, war politics, Google, Google her, Google her. 
Um, tragically, however, the foreshadowing does kick in here. She was the first woman to die in a balloon accident, as well as the first woman to pilot a balloon on her own. Um, she was famous for these pyrotechnic flights. That's the one we used to the fireworks out. That was her speciality. And um, in 1819, the fireworks set fire to the balloon, and she was able to slow the descent and land on a roof, but she got tangled in the ropes and fell from the roof to the ground. Now, many men, including Sophie Blanchard's own husband, had already died in balloon accidents. However, when Sophie died, being the first woman to die in a ballooning accident, guess what everyone said? Women shouldn't pilot balloons. They are too fragile. Uh, so that was that. But but now we can pilot hot air balloons all we want, and maybe don't throw fireworks. <laughs> Just as I mean, I don't know much about ballooning, but I just instinctively feel that um, that that's a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> Moving forward in time, we have Isabella Bird, who I uh, I've already talked to a lot because I keep tangentially going back to Isabella because I really like her. I really like her because she was about my height and like me, she had terrible back problems. Um, unlike me, she was in the Victorian era without a lot of medical knowledge and no anesthesia. So she um, was told by the doctor that she should travel and get fresh air, and she traveled. <laughs> she rode 800 miles in Colorado. She went to Hawaii, which is where she learned to ride um, uh, forward-facing instead of side saddle. She, oh, but, but whenever she was approaching a town, she would stop, freshen herself up, and ride into town sitting side saddle, because she was proper. Mm -hmm. um, she became the first woman fellow of the Royal Geographic Society. She established two hospitals in India, which of course she was in at the time. There's a lot of fresh air in India. Um, she almost died when her horse drowned while crossing a river, and then she almost died again while crossing a desert. Um, she became a war correspondent in Korea and China during the Sino-Japanese War because she happened to be there getting her fresh air. When, um, I'm sorry, it's just never going to get old for me. Fresh air, we get it. Um, she um, really bought a lot of the Victorian stuff about the woman in the home concept, the idea that women are the the moral uh, teachers and civilizers. But she used that kind of as currency. So she could say, well, actually, women should travel more. Because in traveling more, we meet all these guys who have to do things like be snowed in with us for three months. <laughs> and then we can be a good influence on them. <laughs> and so she never lost her social standing. She married for a lot um, at one point um, and stayed at home for a long time. She actually several times tried to stop traveling, but every time she would get horribly depressed and be unable to get out of bed. And finally, somebody would kind of shove her out the door. And the next thing you know, she'd be in England, Scotland, North America, Canada, Australia, Hawaii, Colorado, Japan, Korea, China, Vietnam, Singapore, Malaysia, India, Persia, Kurdistan, Turkey, Baghdad, Tehran, China, Korea, and Morocco. The names of the, the, the traveler or the, the country? The name of the traveler in the world. Is, Isabella Bird. Bird like a bird that flies around. Okay, which she did. Um, so there are all these, like I said, one of the things I found fascinating when I first researched this was I just assumed this was something like maybe rich women would do, right? But women found all kinds of different reasons to travel and re excuses to travel. Annie Royal Taylor was born in 1855, died in 1922. She was the first Western woman known to have visited Tibet. She was a missionary. At the time, there were a whole bunch of missionaries wandering around Tibet, and a lot of them were women. And um, Annie Royal Taylor, the one thing you should know about her is nobody liked her. <laughs> I'm sorry, Annie, it's true. 
English people didn't like her. The people on her tour group didn't like her. The people living in Tibet didn't like her. They had not invited her to be their missionary, and she went into the forbidden city of the skies, and she wasn't supposed to be there. Everybody hated her. Um, she ended up, she kept getting kicked out by missionary groups because nobody liked her. But by golly, she traveled all around Tibet, so that's cool. Um, <laughs> She was another person, this was kind of a running theme. Um, and interestingly, I found this pop up with, ma with men at the time period a lot too. As a child, she was described as frail. Mm -hmm. And so she, you know, rebounded. And she was another teeny tiny person. Um, another woman who um, had a, a very tragic outcome being a missionary into that was Susanna Carson Reinhardt, R I J N A R T. She um, departed for Tibet from China with her husband and her baby in May 1898. And everything went wrong. Oh, no, I have oh, no, 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 no. Everything went wrong and ended very tragically, but she was the sole survivor of her trip. Mm -hmm. So here's what I'm going to tell you in the two seconds that I do not officially have. I am so sorry you guys have so many other people to tell you about. It's killing me. But go, 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 go. Women's history is fascinating, and women are always doing things they're not expected to do. Not just rich women, not just white, white women. People are always finding ways to buck the trends. And I thank you so much for coming. I apologize that I spent too long on some people. Maybe all of you.